solid ground as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, but we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name Thank you, Ensemble. Our ushers are making their way through the congregation. If you did not receive the notes this morning, I certainly think it will be a help to you. If you would raise your hand, let our ushers give you a copy of the notes for this morning's message. Thank you, men, for your help. Thank you, Ensemble, for the beautiful song. Thank you, Choir, for your ministry to us. And I am so grateful for you being here and for those who are visiting with us Today, Please take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 32. In just a moment, we'll stand together in Psalm 32. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, to look this way as soon as you find Psalm 32. Take your Bibles, find Psalm 32, and then look up this way. In my 26 years of ministry, I have literally spoken thousands of times. In fact, 
just since I've been your pastor, I've spoken some 1,500 times. Uh, and uh, so that means that, that there's been a lot that, that we've all forgotten. In fact, if I ask you, what did I preach one year ago? Uh, some of you say, I don't remember what you preached last Sunday, much less one year ago. Uh, the, the, I've spoken a lot. I've talked a lot, I've studied a lot, I've prayed, fasted a lot, and there's been many messages. And through all of these messages, what has happened is we've been fed. There's been a pattern of spiritual feeding that's helped us grow, to stay strong. In my many, many hundreds and hundreds of messages that I've spoken, I try not to repeat. I try to take uh, messages, and uh, even if I'm using a familiar passage of Scripture, to take a fresh approach to that so that you're not getting stale bread. So with all of you looking this way, maybe some need to turn their hearing aid on this morning. But everyone looking this way, of all the messages I preached, I believe that today's message, and, I, and you've, you have heard me some 1,500 times, you've not heard me say this before, I believe that today's message could impact you as a person and our church, Tucson Baptist Church, in a way that's never happened before. And I'd like to ask you to carefully listen to today's message because I'm going to talk about another subject of something that we need to remove from our life and that this is really a problem. It's something that every one of us, we deal with. It's something that every one of us, we struggle with. And maybe today's not your struggle, but certainly there's been a time you struggle with it. But I have no doubt that there are quite a few people struggling with this very thing today. Let's stand together out of honor and respect to the reading of God's Word as we examine our text passage. Now, I'm going to break what we would call the, norm, the normal teachings of homiletics and hermeneutics and, and how that you're supposed to prepare a message. The text is supposed to be what drives us into what we're going to preach about. I'm going to read my text, and we're not going to look at it again until the conclusion of the message. And by the way, we're not supposed to preach messages that way. But uh, I don't know who wrote those rules. I'm writing the rules today, okay? Psalm 32. It is our text that will help us as we conclude our message. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no God. Let's read these two verses together as a congregation. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no God. Father, as I've prayed over this message, and even this morning, just, uh, just listening to the music and just my heart is so stirred up about this message, I pray that all of us will be able to pay attention, open our heart and mind, and that those would work in concert with each other and that we might be able to have a freedom this morning that some of us have been imprisoned by this word guilt for far too long. Father, would you allow your Holy Spirit to work, to permeate? Would you minimize any distractions and help all of us just to listen carefully for the next little bit? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Spring is, is here. We certainly felt that yesterday morning. The temperatures are a little bit cooler. Uh, summer is on the way, and uh, we are all probably planning some type of vacation. Some of you are going to go camping. Others are perhaps looking forward to water skiing. Some of you are going to go to the mountains, uh, uh, looking forward to that campfire. Others are going to go to visit relatives, or maybe you're going to go to Disneyland. Uh, you're going on a cruise, uh, visit uh, other people. Anyway, many of you are planning some type of a vacation, some type uh, of, of trip uh, in the next uh, couple of months with school getting out and summer upon us. Uh, in fact, how many of you are planning something this summer? You're going to get away uh, all across the, the congregation this morning. Hundreds of you are planning to get away. Uh, just, uh, you know, it should be Monday to Saturday, okay? Um, uh, we want to see you on Sunday. Uh, um, uh, but there's one trip that I don't want you to take. And there's one trip that I want you to stop taking, and it's called a guilt trip. 
I want us to get away from the guilt trip. May I just say this morning, the guilt trip is a dead-end road. There's nothing good that comes from the guilt trip. And as we continue our theme of the word behind me, it says remove over May and June. We're looking at certain areas, the, certain topics, certain things that we could remove from our life that would allow us to become a stronger Christian. So I've entitled this morning's message, Remove Guilt replace with God's love. Whenever you remove something, you need to replace it with something. So uh, this morning, let's remove guilt and replace it with God's love. The Bible says that many of our fears are rooted in this word guilt. Listen to this amazing thought from 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 8 says, "There There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Those two words, hath torment, it's been, uh, uh, Phillips has described it this way, fear always contains some of the torture of feeling guilty. And maybe we haven't made this connection yet this morning, but there are fears that many of us have that are caused by guilt. What is that? The fear that I'll be found out. The fear that I'll be rejected by someone else. The fear that someone will retaliate for what I have done. Or the fear that God, he's just going to judge me. That's why people really don't want to die. They're not ready to meet their maker because of this word guilt that is permeated all of a person's life. I say it's high time this morning that we remove guilt from our life. And all of us, we struggle with this word from time to time. But the good news is this morning that you don't have to go on a guilt trip anymore. And if you will listen carefully this morning over the next few minutes, we're going to briefly summarize guilt by examining three questions. Here's question number one. What do I usually do with my guilt? What do I usually do with my guilt? We usually use three common coping mechanisms when we come to our own guilt. Three things that we usually do with our guilt. The first thing that we usually do with our guilt is we bury it. We bury it. At least we try to bury it in many different ways. Have you ever heard someone's advice? They'll say, you've just got to bury your past. There's only one problem. It doesn't work. It keeps resurrecting itself like some horror movie, uh, The Night of the Living Dead. Those guilty feelings, they keep coming back at the most inappropriate times. I was talking with a new Christian in our church, and he's going through discipleship. He's really excited about discipleship. And and as he's going through, he says, uh, Pastor, he says, I'm struggling with something. I said, hey, you know, uh, what is that? I, I wanted to be a help to him. He says, has this ever happened to you that right when you're ready to pray or right when you're reading God's word, things just pop into your mind from years ago and it's like this wave of guilt comes over you. I had the opportunity to share with him these thoughts about guilt. Many times we bury that guilt, just trying to hide from that guilt. The problem is is that it overwhelms us again and again. And when you bury uh, that uh, guilt, uh, it comes up at the most inappropriate times. We all have a favorite way of burying that guilt. Uh, Some of us, we minimize it. And we say, listen, Pastor Armstrong, what I did, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. By the way, it's no big deal until it comes back to bother you. It's no big deal until it crawls out of the ground where you buried it. It's no big deal until you remember it 20 years later. Minimizing is a way of burying your guilt, but may I just say it doesn't work. Another way is we rationalize our guilt. And we say something like this, Pastor, everyone's done it. That may be true. Everyone may have done it, but you're the person that's dealing with the guilt. And by the way, just because everyone has done it, there every one of us, we are sinners, and that never makes it right just because someone else did it. You can always find somebody who's a little bit worse off than you. Hey, listen, folks, I want to, t- I want to tell you something this morning that excites me. I'm better than Hitler. <laughs> Wait, is that supposed to make me feel better? 
We can always find someone that we're a little bit better. And so sometimes we try to rationalize it. Here's what rationalize means, and I hope that you'll never forget this. Rationalize means this, rational lies. Rationalize, when I try to rationalize something, it just means it's a rational lie. Rationalize means telling uh, uh, myself and my mind what I know that is not true in my heart. It's a battle between my mind and my heart, and I'm trying to convince myself that it's okay. The heart's saying, who are you kidding? We compromise, and if we feel bad about what we've done, we just lower our standards. That's another way of, of bearing it. You know what? Well, I'll just, I'll just lower my standard a little bit, and then I don't feel quite so guilty. There was a fortune cookie that said this, commit a sin twice, and it won't seem a sin. How brilliant and how true. By the way, the 15th murder is never as hard as the first. The fifth time you get drunk is never as bad as the first time you get drunk. The pattern of using drugs is never as bad as the first time you used drugs and swore you'd never do it again. It doesn't bother you anymore today for that sin that you're involved in because you have what is referred to as a seared conscience. I remind you what the writer of Proverbs says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Why is that? Because it's going to catch up with you, especially in today's society. Today, it doesn't matter what you did 20 years ago. Uh, years ago. It's still fair game for the media. It's eventually going to catch up with you. Would you turn over just a couple pages to Psalm 32? Psalm 32. And more than that, trying to bury the guilt you feel over, uh, that you feel over reasons. And by the way, we've all got reasons to feel guilty. We all have regrets. We all have mistakes. We all have failures. Every Every one of us, we have sinned. We all have problems, but the real problem with bearing the guilt is the complete waste of so much emotional energy. Listen to a dude in the, in the book of Psalms that had some guilt. His name was David. Psalm 32, verse 3, when I kept silence... My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said... I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. By the way, that's what God will do today. He'll forgive your sin. David said it just made him miserable trying to hide from his sin. It sapped all of his energy. He was spending so much emotional energy trying to keep it down and not think about it, but it just kept popping back up. It was as, as if the more he tried to run from it, the more it caught up to him. Burying your guilt doesn't work. Here's the second thing we try to do when it comes to guilt. We blame others. We blame others. This is as old as creation. Clear back in the Garden of Eden, the very first man that was created, Adam, uh, it didn't take long uh, for him to commit a sin, and he began to blame his wife. He sinned, and then he said to God, the woman that thou gavest to me uh, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. He's actually blaming God. Adam's saying, it was the woman that you gave me. Typical. And people have been doing it ever since. By the way, you really spell blame is this way. Be lame. Be lame. When you're blaming, you're always being lame. You're not accepting responsibility. And today, uh, we are all pros of excusing and excusing and accusing. And we're great at excusing ourselves. And we're wonderful at accusing someone else. It's what I call the victimization of America. It's not my fault. I may have done something horrible, but it was because when I was three years old, my mother held my, my head under the bath water too long, and, and, and I've had these repressed feelings, and that's why I blew up that building. Uh, I can't help it. Uh, we blame others, and we come up with this ridiculous things uh, 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 of how we can excuse ourselves by accusing someone else. We are very good at blaming others. By the way, it doesn't work. It's our 
irresponsible and that's our terrible example to our children and grandchildren that have us in perhaps the mess we're in as a society today. Why do uh, we blame others then? We use blame as a, as a balance of our guilt. Uh, in our mind, there's a balance. On one side, there's this guilt that's weighing me down. And on the other side of the scale, there's this blame. And, and, and the more I can blame someone else, uh, uh, I don't feel quite so guilty about it. And we try to balance out our guilt by pointing out the faults and the failures of other people as if that negotiates or deletes what I have done. By the way, it doesn't work. Sometimes we even blame God. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 3 says, The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth or fighteth against the Lord. We say, God, why are you allowing this? By the way, it's not God's fault. And I'd like for you to consider this thought for a second. Have you ever considered that maybe your guilt might be from some of the poor choices you have made in life. Maybe the guilt is from your poor choices in life. But there's a third thing we do with guilt. Oh, we bury it, we blame others, and then we beat up ourselves. And this doesn't work either. When we beat up ourselves, we we, we, we basically try to, uh, to... take things out on ourselves and to punish ourselves and we self-administer punishment and subconsciously we say something like this, okay, I did, res- I did wrong and I deserve to pay for it and our body decides to take over and prove uh, that we're going to have to pay for it and we end up beating up ourselves over something that we've done. I ask you a question, can a guilty conscience make you depressed? Absolutely. Depression is often a way of atonement. I did wrong, and therefore I should punish myself, so I'm going to be depressed. Can a guilty conscience cause you to set yourself up for a failure? Absolutely, you bet it can. Uh, You're working hard consciously, but unconsciously you're thinking, I don't deserve to succeed. I don't deserve that promotion. Subconsciously, you sabotage your own efforts. And guilt has an amazing way of causing us to uh, take that payment out on ourselves. By the way, this is what happened to David. David in Psalm 38, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure, for thine errors stick fast in me, and thy hand presses me sore. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as a heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt. Because of someone else's foolishness. I don't think that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness or my sin. I am troubled and I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. There's a problem with beating up yourself. Your conscience doesn't ever know when to quit, so it keeps going on and on. And listen to me. There's some folks here today on this very Sunday morning, you've been beating up yourself for 20, 25, 30 years for something that happened a long, long time ago. There are people here today, you have a secret shame that you have have held in your heart what is your secret shame you keep thinking every time something goes wrong in your life God's just getting even with me God's making me pay your conscience doesn't know when to say enough is enough so this morning we see the first question is what I usually do with my guilt and I, I bury it and I beat up myself and I blame others. But I, I am so glad that you're here and there's a, there's a question number two and I believe that this could be a help to you and I believe that for every one of us we could take this next section of the message and it could radically transform our life and give us a freedom that we haven't experienced in years. And here's question number two, what should I do with my guilt? What should I do? I have a secret shame that I've been harboring for months, years, decades. What should I do with my guilt? The Bible is very clear. 
And the Bible is very specific. The Bible tells us how that we can get off of the guilt trip. The Bible tells us how we can stop the guilt trip. And there's no reason. There's not a single reason unless you choose to live in that self-imprisoned guilt that you should ever walk out of these doors this morning feeling guilty for something that you've done if you're willing to do what God tells you to do. He, he gives us some very simple steps. And step number one, even though it is simple, it is not easy. Number one, I admit it. I admit it. I don't minimize it. I don't bury it. I don't ignore it. I don't push it down. I don't deny it. I simply own up to it. I admit it. God, that was wrong. That was sin. It was a stupid, dumb thing. I willfully chose to do the wrong thing because I, it was what I wanted to do at the time. But it was wrong. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Sometimes people try to get rid of their guilt by running from it, and we run from it in many different ways. And some people try to escape through drugs and through alcohol or through pornography or through spending money or, or through taking some trip. The problem with the solution is that no matter where you go, your conscience always goes with you. You can't get away from it. It just stays there. When you finally slow down and it's quiet, those waves of feelings, those waves of guilt, they still come and manifest themselves in our life. 1 John 1 verse 9 is one of the greatest verses in all of the Bible. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Oh, he is also just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us, that word cleanse means to make as if it never happened. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we're just lying to ourselves if we don't admit the things that we've done wrong. We deceive ourselves. A husband gets mad at his wife. Blows up! I know that would never happen at this church. Says things. To this day, he's never, ever asked his wife for forgiveness. Ah, she knows that I forget. That, that she knows that um, uh, she really caused me to blow up. It's, I, I blame. Ah, she knows that I'm really sorry. If you want to stop defeating yourself, you've got to stop deceiving yourself. If you want to stop defeating yourself, you've got to stop deceiving yourself. Call it for what it is. Say, you're right. I'm wrong. If you're serious about clearing your conscience, you've got to have some quiet time apart from social media, apart from the television, apart from your phone, apart from the radio, apart from people. And you've got to have some private time with God to say, God, I'm ready. Bring those things and call them to my attention that I need to confess, I need to admit. Lamentations 3 and verse 40 says this, Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Do a spiritual inventory of your life so that you can have a clear conscience. Maybe write down those things that you feel guilty about. Write them out. Writing forces you to be specific and thoughts disentangle themselves when they pass through the lips and the fingertips. And if I can say it and I can write it, I've really thought about it and I can write those down. I admit those things. Yes, God, let's examine my ways. And then after you... Complete that list, whether in your conscience or writing it down. You say, okay, God, I'm admitting it to you. I have messed up. These are things that I have done wrong. Now that you've admitted your guilt and you're wrong, the second phase of what we should do with this guilt is we have to accept responsibility for it. We must accept responsibility for it. This is more than just admitting it. It's saying, it really was my fault. I don't rationalize it. I don't say it happened so long ago. I don't blame others and it was mostly their fault. It, it may have been mostly their fault. I'd like for you to listen up for just a second. Someone could have wronged you by 99% and you're only 1% guilty. Are you still guilty? About half of you agree. If you're 1% guilty, you're still guilty. No matter if the other person is 99.9% .9 in the wrong. 
Instead of focusing on their wrong, I need to focus on my wrong. And if you've been carrying the guilt around, you're the one who needs to deal with it. And you can't deal with someone else's guilt. There's no person in here that can deal with someone else's guilt. They have to deal with that themselves. So you don't minimize it. And you don't make excuses, but you accept the responsibility for that which you've done wrong. So many times we're dishonest with each other and we'll wear a mask and we play games and we play as if we have it all together when we know inside we are screaming, I don't have anything together. We act like we've never sinned and when everybody knows we have sinned, we pretend we're perfect when everyone knows we're not perfect. Because we don't admit that we're just human beings, that we have all fallen short, we isolate ourselves from one another. And this causes fear, and that fear comes out in all kinds of different realms. Uh, Fear and guilt that prevents intimacy, and fear and guilt creates insecurity. If they really knew me, they would reject me. If someone really knew my shortcomings, they would never want me to be their pastor. If someone really knew who Brent Armstrong was, they would never come back on a Sunday. Listen, every one of us can say that if people really knew what we were really like. The fact is, and I'd like for everyone to listen, the fact is, I'm only as sick as my secrets. I'm only as sick as my secrets. God says revealing and admitting or dealing with your sin with him is the beginning of healing. And everybody in the world needs at least one person in their life that they can be totally honest with. Knowing that they're not going to be judged. Wouldn't you like to have someone in your life like that? How many of you would like to have someone that you could be totally honest, totally transparent, and that person will not judge you? How many of you like to have someone in your life like that? May I just tell you, his name is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. He stands willing and waiting for you to be honest with him. And it's God's way of freeing us. And that leads us to the third thing. And that is, is that I've certainly, I've, I've admitted it. I've accepted responsibility. And the third thing I must do is I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to ask him to forgive whatever I'm struggling with. We read 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess, I must confess. Wouldn't you like to be thoroughly, completely forgiven? Wouldn't you like to get off of the guilt trip completely forgiven? Wouldn't you like to have no skeletons in your closet that someone can point a finger at? May I just tell you, God will wipe out your sin. Even if there was not such a place as heaven, and I'm thankful there is, it would be worth becoming a Christian just for the joy of having a clear conscience, the freedom of knowing it's been dealt with. Now, as I studied and I thought about this, I want to make sure we understand that there's some right ways and some wrong ways to ask God for forgiveness. Wrong ways, you don't have to beg God to forgive you. You don't have to beg, oh, pretty please, pretty, pretty please, and you got to say pretty please seven times for God to really forgive you. God is merciful. God's gracious. He's loving. He loves to forgive, and he's more willing to forgive than you are to ask for it. And he's waiting to forgive you. God, please forgive me, and you name it. You don't have to bargain with God. Oh, you don't have to beg God, but you don't have to bargain with God. Now listen, God. God, I know I messed up. And, and, and for 15 years, I've been begging you and making a deal with you. And, 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 I, and I've said something like this. God, if you will forgive me, I'll read my Bible every single morning until three days from now when you forgot to read your Bible. God, if you will forgive me, I'll start tithing 12%. Well, that's a performance work forgiveness prayer. You don't have to beg You don't have to bargain, and you don't ever bribe God. You don't bribe God. God, now listen, I know I did wrong, but here's what I'm going to do for you. I'll never sin again if you'll do this. 
I think God would just smile at that and say, oh, you don't understand. All you have to do is ask, and I'll forgive. You don't have to bribe me. But there is a right way, and that is that you must believe. You must believe that for all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. And usually we stop there in verse number 23. But there is a verse 24 that goes hand in hand with verse 23. Listen to this. Being justified freely by his, through his, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The reason he forgives is because of what Jesus Christ did, not what you do. The most basic truth of Christianity is this. Jesus Christ paid for my sins on the cross. It's the most basic truth. If you're here today, you come from a different background, you come from a a, a different type of church, you come from a different whatever, religious background. Here's the basic truth. Has nothing to do with being Baptist, Methodist, whatever you want to be. Let me just say this. The basic truth is this. Jesus Christ paid for my sins on the cross. And I have to simply ask for forgiveness. I have to accept his forgiveness. And uh, that forgiveness is not based on what I do. It's based on what he has done. It's based on his mercy. It's based on his love. And I don't know what you've done, but I know what Jesus has done. And what Jesus has done is far better, far greater, far more accomplished than what you have done in this world. What he's done is greater than the sin that you have done. What he's done can take care of any sin that you've done. In fact, the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. Now, some of us say this morning, now, I've asked God to forgive me, but I don't feel forgiven. I don't feel it. And many Christians would say, listen, I'm a believer, and, and I, 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 I had an abortion, and I've asked God a million times to forgive me. I, I, I am addicted to pornography, and I've asked God a million times to forgive me. I stole something 20 years ago, and it, and, and it hurt the company, and, and I'm embarrassed if they would ever find out. And, and I lied to someone over here, and I committed adultery over here, and, and I, oh, I, I've got... Uh, You've done some really bad things. You don't feel. That's because you simply don't understand how God forgives. You may even be a Christian. You've confessed all of your sins, but you still feel guilty. And if you feel guilty over a sin you've already confessed, may I just tell you that guilt is not from God. It's from the devil. God does not make you feel guilty over the things that you've already confessed. Satan is the one who's the accuser of the brethren. And we have seen what we usually do with our guilt, and we've seen what we should do with our guilt. Third, and very quickly this morning, may I just ask you this third question, what does God want me to do with my guilt? What does God want me to do with my guilt? And there's so many of us that we're racked inside our brains and inside our body with a guilt of something that we've done. There are four things that God wants you to do today with your guilt. The Bible says very clearly that God does four things when you admit and you accept uh, responsibility and you ask for his forgiveness. I'm so thankful that I can declare on the basis and authority of God's word, number one, God forgives instantly. God forgives instantly instantly. He will have mercy upon him. He will abundantly pardon. God doesn't say, all right, um, you've accepted responsibility. You've admitted it. You've asked for my forgiveness. Now, let me just think about it for a day. Let me you know what? This was a big sin. I need a couple months to think about this, and I'll get back with you. That's not the God I serve. That's not the God of the Bible. There is no delay. There is no waiting period. There is no time frame that has to pass by. It is quick. It is instant. You say, should I ever feel guilty? Yes, you should. For about 30 seconds. That's about how long it takes for you to admit it, accept responsibility, to ask God to forgive you, and to accept his forgiveness. There's this myth that says, if I feel guilty, it makes me a better person. No, it doesn't. Quite frankly, that's ridiculous. 
I, if I beat myself up because of something that I did, then, 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 then that makes me a better person. You know what you are? You're a miserable person. I don't want to be around you. It's ridiculous to beat yourself up if you followed what the Bible says. Another myth is, is this. I should always feel guilty about something. No, you shouldn't. That's not living under grace. God forgives instantly. Number two thing that he does, not only does God forgive instantly, but God forgives us completely. God forgives us completely. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And took it uh, out of the way, nailing it to the cross. When Jesus Christ, he died for your sins. Which one did he die for? Are you sure? That's what the Bible says. He died for all of your sins. Not for just the ones yesterday. Not for just the ones today. But also for the ones that you will commit tomorrow. Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross so that you can quit nailing yourself to the cross. He forgives completely. In that passage of scripture, if you understand the word blotting out, it's like a super stain remover. He's completely annulled it. How long do you, how many of you paid Tucson Electric Power last month? How many of, all right, so some of you, you, there's different ways. Uh, Some of you, you write a check, and some of you maybe do a money order. Some of you have it taken directly out of your uh, account. And and here's here's the thing. Uh, You paid it last month. How many of you have thought a thing about it since you paid it? None of us. We paid the bill. It was done. Now, if you're late on a bill, you're thinking about it. I'm thinking about the interest charge. Are they going to cut off my electricity because I haven't paid the bill yet? May I just tell you, he completely paid the bill and he hasn't thought a thing about it since. Have you ever thought about that? He paid the bill. If, you, if God, if, you, if he says you confess and he says I forgive you instantly, he says I forgive you completely, the Bible says that he buries that in the depths of the sea. He says he doesn't remember it as far as the east is from the west. Guess what? The east never meets the west. But sometimes we are the ones who go fishing in the deep sea to see if we can bring that sin back out from the depths of the ocean that he said he buried it in. If you don't understand this, then every time something goes wrong in your life, you're going to think, hey, God's getting even with me. He doesn't do that. He's forgiven you instantly, completely. And thirdly, God forgives me. And I'm, I, I had to put this in there because of Brent. He forgives me repeatedly. Have you ever committed the same sin twice or multiple times? God forgives me repeatedly. Do you ever feel embarrassed like me to go back to God and say, oh, God, I messed up again. I, I did that again. I know I just asked you two days, to for, two days ago to forgive me, but I, it's, and here's what happens. We are so embarrassed because we are sinners that we don't go back and ask for forgiveness, and therefore it starts this guilt cycle and this guilt trip in our life. May I remind you, he's a merciful, forgiving, amazing God. He loves to forgive. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews that Christ is there ever making intercession for us. He works on our behalf. He is always uh, working to help God uh, forgive us our sins. He's the great advocate that works on our behalf. Oh, my time's going by so quickly. Let me tell you the fourth thing he does is that he forgives freely. Freely. First, uh, uh, ver- uh, chapter 1, verse 7 of Ephesians says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You'll never be able to earn it. You do not deserve it. It's just this. It's a gift of grace. It's free. And because it is free, uh, we, all we have to do is just accept it. Because you are a human being, your greatest single need is forgiveness. And because God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, his greatest gift to you is forgiveness. I'd like to ask all of you a question. I think your notes is finished. In fact, why don't you put up your pen and your paper, and so that way we can all listen to this last question, and then I'm forgiven. 
And then as soon as you put that up, if you'll just look this way. I'd like to ask you a very direct question. What is the secret shame that you are haunted with? What is the secret shame that you're haunted with? The moment I said it, you already thought about it. It already came to your mind. It's in your mind right now. Maybe you're even afraid that someone could read your mind right now. What is your single sh biggest shame? Nobody has to tell you. It could be something that happened this weekend. It could be something that happened a year ago, 10 years ago. It could be something that your spouse does not even know about. But something your children, grandchildren do not know about. It is a secret shame. Now I go back to my text verse. Before, the, before I read them one last time, I'd like to ask you to take up today's challenge. Remove guilt. Replace with God's love and his forgiveness. We read this. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. How do you really spell the word remove? I say that really the way you spell the remove is this way. J-E-S-U-S. -S. He removes the guilt, the stain of that guilt from your life. I'm looking at hundreds of people this morning. And obviously, you're not running to the altar to say, let me confess to the whole church my, all my sin. I'm not asking for that. But as your pastor, you are on a guilt trip. And you know it. Oh, maybe two or three days go by and it doesn't haunt you and you're like relief. But at the most inopportune time, it comes back up. And it's there. And it haunts you. This morning, would you simply do what the Bible says? Admit. Admit. Accept the responsibility. Ask God to forgive you. He'll instantly forgive you. Instantly. And leave these doors with your head held high knowing I am forgiven. And if, the, any, if any waves of guilt come back, it is from the devil. Devil, get out of my life. There are a lot of sins. A lot of things that we have guilt over. Church, if you leave here today on a guilt trip, you've chosen to do that. You have made the conscientious decision, I'm not willing to admit, accept, ask. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Thank you so very much for your wonderful attention. What is your secret shame? God will forgive and free you today from guilt. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In just a moment, there'll be an opportunity right here before the Lord just to talk to Him. You and God know what you need to confess. Would you be willing to do that today? I had to do that before I preached. Yesterday, I was thinking about the message. This morning, the Lord brought something to my mind. I wanted to be able to preach this message with a clear conscience, so I had to talk with the Lord, and there were some things I had to admit, accept, and ask. Your pastor, would we as a church be willing to do that? Father, I pray that even right now, you will cause us, propel us to obey the message. So many of us, we live on a guilt trip, a guilt trip, rather than freedom from what Jesus has done. Father, I pray you'll speak to hearts even right now. We'll we will obey the word. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The Sam sings softly. 
I'm asking you, would you step out, do business with the Lord right now. Get away from that guilt trip. Confess, forsake, and you get victory today. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. <laughs> Many have responded. Some have sat down in their seats. In a crowd of hundreds and hundreds, there are so many people who are struggling with some area of their life of guilt. Get victory today. Please, I beg you, get victory today. Would you talk to the Lord right now, wherever you're standing, or slip out and have a time of prayer as Sam sings this next verse. Let's get victory today. Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior. Thank you, may look this way. Thank you for your great attention. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings at this time. And uh, one of our young men, Tim Ford, is going to come and pray for us. And as he prays, uh, you can be seated right after he prays, okay? And then we'll receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Let's pray. Dearly Father, God, just thank you for the opportunity that we had to, to come to church today, God. Thank you for Pastor Armstrong, God, and for the great blessing he's been on all of our lives here, God. Thank you for this powerful message that we had that you can just let this sit in our hearts and allow it to change us forever, God. I just pray that you can be with the offering, God. Let it do good things for your work, God. I just pray that you can give us a safe trip home in your name. Amen.